We thank John for providing the offertory this morning. Just as a reminder, my name is Dacia and I use she, her pronouns. The reading in my high school English lit classes included To Kill a Mockingbird, Brave New World, 1984, The Jungle, Animal Farm, Tom Sawyer, and Huckleberry Finn. In retrospect, I see that much of my education included what some would have considered very controversial reading. As an adult, I've read Grapes of Wrath, Sophie's Choice, Wild Swans, Harry Potter, and the Little House books. My name is Eva Remold, and I use she, her pronouns. I certainly have read lots of banned books, whether I realized it or not. Um, many of those that Dacia mentioned, and, and I remember the book Grapes of Wrath, uh, I remember discussing it in a college intro to literature class. Uh, many of these that Dacia just mentioned and more are considered classics. I would say that these were books on the edge of cultural change. They took some of the blinders off our eyes to look at the world in a new way, which seemed to have upset the social order. So Dacia, how did it come about that we're doing a service on banned books? Well, on August 15th of this year, I read an article in the New York Times. The title was, In Backlash to Racial Reckoning, Conservative Publishers See Gold. And then the title included an example title of an upcoming book. And the title of that upcoming book is, I Can't Breathe, How a Racial Hoax is Killing America. I was shocked, truly shocked by the hostility of that title. And I had a completely sleepless night. I was so upset by that um, information. And I wound up being really worried and thinking about and wondering about really, you know, I just like to ban that book. Um, well, then a few days later, Saturday, August 21st, I attended Reverend Michelle's Zoom meeting uh, to start planning the Sunday services for September. And there it was, banned book weeks at the end of September. Since I'd been contemplating my own personal desire to ban some books, I was intrigued. And I thought also that it would fit right in with a focus on our fourth principle, the free and responsible search for truth and meaning. And then I cajoled Eva into planning this service with me. Even I, even I've made use of a number of resources and the footnote information will be available in the member's email on Tuesday. When it comes to dealing with the desire to ban books, I know that libraries are on the front lines. So we decided to ask a librarian. Heather Cottle Dillon is a librarian here in Springfield and she shared her thoughts with us. Hi, my name is Heather and I'm the reference department manager of the Schweitzer Brentwood Branch Library, a public library here in Springfield. Thank you so much for letting me talk to you about banned books today. So first I'd like to provide some definitions in case this topic is new to you. Um, when we say a book is challenged, that is an attempt to remove or restrict materials based on the objections of a person or group. So this usually looks like someone coming across a book in the library or a book that their child brings home from their school library that they find objectionable. And they go to the administration of the library or school to ask that it be removed. So that is a challenge and a ban is when they actually remove that material. So this is something that we take very seriously in libraries. So I appreciate the invitation to talk about it. So one of the guiding principles for libraries, especially public libraries, is the freedom to read, which is the idea that materials on all topics should be accessible to everyone and that reading materials should not be censored. This idea is summed up by some of these statements from the American Library Association's Library Bill of Rights. First is libraries should provide materials and information presenting all points of view on current and historical issues. Materials should not be proscribed or removed because of partisan disapproval. Libraries should challenge censorship in the fulfillment of their responsibility to provide information and enlightenment. So there's some more parts to that. Um, and if you're interested in reading the full document, you can find it by doing an internet search for American Library Association Library Bill of Rights. But those statements can nicely summarize why librarians and others in the book community care so much about banned books. Um, providing access to information is what we're all about. So 
We believe that no one has the right to restrict another person's freedom to read. And so that's why we have Banned Books Week, which is September 26th to August 2nd this year. Banned Books Week started in the 1980s. Uh, at that time, there were a lot of increased challenges to books in school and public libraries. And then there was a Supreme Court case in 1982 called Island Trees School District versus Pico, in which the Supreme Court ruled that school officials can't ban books in libraries simply because of their content. So after that, Banned Books Week kind of took off and we now have it the, typically the last week of September and use that week to spotlight current and historical attempts to censor books in libraries and schools. Um, yeah, a lot of people don't realize that there are still books that are being challenged and banned today. Um, at the Springfield Green County Library, we do experience challenges to books occasionally. Um, probably on average, you know, it varies, but sometimes like a few a year. Um, times there'll be where someone will ask us to remove a material from the collection. Um, or sometimes to move material from one section to another. So for instance, to move something from the children's section um, to the young adult section. Um, and in my 12 years at the library, I, I know of a couple scenarios where they might have moved one from one section to another, think, realizing that um, maybe it actually did belong in their section, but I think it's been a really long time since something has been actually removed. Um, nationwide, the American Library Association's Office for Intellectual Freedom tracks challenges to books. And in 2020, they tracked 156 challenges to library, school, and university materials. However, they estimate that at least 80% of challenges don't actually make it to their office, so the number is actually much higher. Um, and the, in 2020, the most challenged titles were, number one, George by Alex Gino. Number two, Stamped. Racism, Anti-Racism, and You by Ibram X. Kendry and Jason Reynolds. Number three, All American Boys by Jason Reynolds and Brendan Keeley. Number four, Speak by Lori Hall Sanderson. Number five, The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian by Sherman Alexi. Number six, Something Happened in Our Town, A Child's Story About Racial Injustice by Marianne Solano, Marietta Collins, and Anne Hazard. Number seven, a To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. Number eight, Of Mice and Men by John Steinbeck. Number nine, The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison. Number 10, The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas. So those are the top 10 uh, books that were challenged nationwide in 2020. And I encourage you to celebrate Band Band's Band Books Week by checking out one of those frequently challenged titles or um, or other challenge titles, you can find a list of those on the American Library Association website. Um, so if you search American Library Association Band of Books, you'll find um, the list of, of most challenged books, um, as well as other information about, about banned books. Um, we do have banned book displays at several of our Springfield Green County Library branches this month, and library staff are always happy to discuss this topic with anyone further. So feel free to stop by your library branch if you have any questions or you would like to find a banned book to check out. Uh, thanks again for having me, everyone, and happy Band Books Week. Have a great day. I was so surprised about some of the books that Heather mentioned that are banned or challenged in 2020. Of Mice and Men, The Bluest Eye, <laughs> Mockingbird, and others. Um, Eva, what did we learn from our survey? Uh, well, first of all, I want to thank those who responded to the survey. Survey, And I would say about half were aware that the book they read was banned at the time, and about half were not. Some read the particular book because it was banned. All were positive about the particular book they read. Among the ones read were Wrinkle in Time, Gone with the Wind, Diary of Van Frank, Lady Chatterley's Lover, 1984, The Jungle, and Grapes of Wrath. Uh, I might mention that the reader of later Lady Chatterley's Lover became even more aware of the time and cultural changes from that period if in time of the writing to the present regarding dialogue between men and women and what was scandalous then and now. 
and other readers also gain more appreciation of the time period in which the book was set. The reader of A Wrinkle in Time added that she read it many times to her children and found the messages to be very positive. Someone else commented that there is much junk also at the library that could be detrimental, and so guessed that, in quotes, that the only books considered truly dangerous were those that challenged the values and authority of those in power, close quotes. Uh, Daisy, tell me, what do they do about banning books in other countries? Well, um, according to Wikipedia's list of books banned by governments, Canada bans hate literature, defamation, and obscenity. Australia bans instructions to crime, like how to make disposable silencers and instructions for suicide or euthanasia. Austria prohibits the ownership or publication of Mein Kampf because it glorifies Nazi goals. Belgium bans slander. Great Britain bans child pornography. Modern Germany bans Mein Kampf, but it does not apply to existing copies. Nazi Germany banned all books by Jewish writers and books with Jewish characters like Ivanhoe and Oliver Twist. In France, at one time or another, uh, uh, Madame Bovary, Lolita, uh, have been banned, and the promotion of suicide is banned. In China, Alice in Wonderland was banned for attributing human language to animals, and the uh, book, uh, the novel Wild Swans, was banned, maybe is banned. In Russia, Thomas Paine's The Rights of Man, Mein Kampf, Animal Farm, 1984, Dr. Shivago, and anything by Solzhenitsyn have been banned. In South Africa, the autobiography of Malcolm X and Frankenstein were banned. And the, in the United States, at one time or another, Canterbury Tales, Maul Flanders, Lady Chatterley's Lover, Candide, Uncle Tom's Cabin, and Grapes of Wrath were banned. Also, uh, more recently, the Pentagon Papers were banned. And a footnote on that is just that the UUA published the Pentagon Papers in 1972. This resulted in a federal investigation of UUA bank records and a uh, federal case um, in 1973 in which the um, uh, UUA was found to be at no fault for uh, ban for publishing those that information. Uh, additional information about the Pentagon Papers and the UUA is available on the UUA website. Now, Eva, I know that you've read Satanic Verses. What about it do you think caused such a big fervor? Uh, yes, the Satanic Verses by Salman Rushdie has been my biggest banned book experience. I'm sure many of you remember the fatwa against Salman Rushdie in 1989 by the Ayatollah Khomeini. There was so much emotion attached to that book that I remember exactly where I was when I was reading it. I was on vacation with my family on the beach in Biloxi, Mississippi, and I remember laughing out loud at times as it's, it is quite funny in places. But I was a little nervous, even as I was reading it in paperback. Uh, initially, the book was highly acclaimed. It won prestigious awards in the UK. And then Muslims accused it of blasphemy and mocking their faith. Assassinations were attempted on Rushdie's life. One of his translators was killed. Another injured and several other people were killed and books were burned burned due to the fatwa. Now, as to the story itself, I had to refresh my memory with some Wikipedia research because it is a complicated story. At the beginning of the story, two actors of Indian Muslim background are trapped in a hijacked plane. The plane explodes over the English Channel and they are magically saved and in the transformation uh, take, one takes on the personality of the Archangel Gabriel and the other of a devil. Now the plot has many complications and deals with revenge and forgiveness and uh, Indian identity. 
in the story itself. <clears throat> the satanic verses were particular verses <clears throat> created by the prophet who proclaimed them as revelation in favor of the old polytheistic deities. And then later, he renounced them as work of the devil. So that's where the word, the name satanic verses comes from. The book itself comments on being an immigrant in Great Britain, on divine revelation, religious fanaticism, brutality, and alienation. Many of these religious, social, and political themes really are of a universal nature in the book as well, not just particular to Islam. Uh, Rushdie himself is from an Indian Muslim tradition. Some critics said that it was ironic that Rushdie was writing about the danger of absolute belief systems. The nature of religion questions about revelations, the power politics of religion, and the immaturity of cultures to handle diversity. And what happened to him and others is the exact reaction of an absolutist religion and culture. Now, as to my opinion about what caused the great fervor, in my limited knowledge of Islam, I would say that Rushdie did make fun of traditional Islam. The book is comic. He used modern language with modern characters in the style of magical realism. He told stories that I think mocked the mythology of Revelation and the character, <coughs> the character of Muhammad, uh, although he doesn't have that name in the book, and the laws about and truths of Islam. It was really sophisticated reading for traditional Muslims with a limited worldview and who would never think of questioning their religion. In other cultures, a book such as this one might get a strong reaction from, say, a traditional Christian or an Orthodox Jew or a fundamentalist of another religion as well, uh, in reaction uh, to literature that mocked that particular religion. But I think the strength of the reaction in these modern times was what shocked much of the world. So Dacia, what was it about that New York Times article that caused you such distress? Well, uh, first, I just want to say how impressed I am that, Eva, that you read Satanic Verses, because I did try, and I found it incomprehensible, so uh, hats off. <laughs> um, and with regard to that New York Times article, um, up to the point that I read that headline, I had been thinking, feeling hopeful that the United States had finally begun to make may be great, but at least strides in acknowledging the racism that is endemic in our country. So I was stunned, truly stunned, by the clear hostility toward understanding racial disparities and injustice um, evident in that title, I Can't Breathe, How a Racial Hoax is Killing America. It just left me breathless. Then there are other uh, examples, things like taking a false premise and writing a whole book about it, such as a book called Enemy Within, How a Totalitarian Movement is Destroying America by David Horowitz. And the cover of this book features extremely unflattering photos of the entire democratic leadership. And then there's the, the type of book that is accusing any critic uh, of doing exactly what they, in fact, are doing. So they make use of projection and misdirection um, and red herrings. And an example title is Liars, How Progressives Exploit Our Fears for Power and Control by Glenn Beck. When, in fact, that's exactly what the book is doing in reverse. And then on top of all of that, there is the profit motive. The conservative press interviewed in this article is very eager about the opportunity for profit represented, represented by these titles. Uh, there's no concern uh, at all about potential consequences, and there's no concern for accuracy um, about the facts. There's no concern about slander, libel, or deception. And I was really disheartened. 
I remembered a book uh, from 2007 titled Unspun, Finding Facts in a World of Disinformation. The book was, is by Brooks Jackson and Kathleen Hall Jameson. And they wrote, we live in a world of spin. It flies at us in the form of misleading commercials for products and political candidates and about policy matters. It comes from businesses, political leaders, lobbying groups, and political parties. Millions are deceived every day, buying products, voting for candidates, supporting policies, and even wars, all because of spin. Spin, they go on to point out, is a polite word for deception. Spinners mislead by means that range from subtle omission <clears throat> to outright lies. Spin paints a false picture of reality by bending facts, mischaracterizing the words of others, and ignoring or denying crucial evidence, or just spinning a yarn by making things up, close quote. Eva, what do you think should be done about these concerns? <clears throat> mm, what a complicated issue. My, my, my first thought is to consider our librarians' policy of the importance of freedom of speech and ban or challenge in the least possible way. It's so difficult and complicated. Uh, how have you come to think of it, Dacia, after pondering the question for a while? Well, I tried really hard to understand the intensity of my response to that headline article from the New York Times article. And I was grateful when a sen friend sent me an NPR podcast by a man named Jason Reynolds. I didn't know who he was, but Jason Reynolds is currently the honorary chair of the 2021 Banned Books Week. And he also happens to be the co-author of two of the 10 most banned books in 2020. Those books are All American Boys, which he wrote with Brian Keeley, and Stamped, Racism, Anti-Racism, and You, with Ibrahim X. Kendi. And there was a lot in that podcast, but what I most clearly remember is he talked about moral panic. And I realized, listening to him, that my reaction to that New York Times article was a great example of a moral panic. I was distressed and very alarmed, and I wanted to do something, anything definitive. And my first go-to was, I want to ban those books. Now, this doesn't seem like me, but there I was, wanting to ban books. Um, it also caused me to realize that I actually have something in common with other people who want to ban books. It never occurred to me to think about uh, um, the motivations behind other people wanting to ban books. But uh, if you're feeling th that threatened, that the underpinnings of, of your universe are uh, in danger, then you know we have a little bit there that might be in common. I went on to think about our fourth principle, which is the free and responsible search for truth and meaning. And I wondered then about, well, you know, maybe a rating system similar to movies and music and video games. And I knew as soon as I had the thought, let alone say it out loud, that every librarian I know is going to have their hair on fire uh, because that is in general considered to be a really bad idea. Um, so actually, my response to the article ha keeps shifting. More, more. It's better to say my response to my response to the article keeps shifting. Uh, because I realized that a moral panic is an intellectual reaction. Um, but it is also emotional and spiritual. And that actually, knowing that, helps to loosen up the intensity of the panic. Um, I get some somewhat uneasy comfort from John Milton's words about freedom and the staying power of truth. Now, John Milton <clears throat> is the author of Paradise Lost, which most of us have heard of and not all that many of us have read, myself included. But there is an excerpt in our hymnal from some of his political writing from a pamphlet called Areopagitica 
which means freedom of speech or free to speak, I think. Um, anyway, and that uh, blurb was written in 1644 during an English civil war. And in it, he said, and I'm only going to give you the last couple of, of um, sentences, but you could find that the UUA's summation of it in the, um, the gray hymnal, Singing the Living Tradition, it's number 671. And um, the reading concludes, and though all the winds of doctrine were let loose to play upon the earth, so truth be in the field, we do injuriously to misdoubt her strength. For who knows not that truth is strong? Next to the Almighty, she needs no policies, no stratagems to make her victorious. Let her and falsehood grapple. Whoever knew truth to be put to the worst in a free and open encounter. And yet, I misdoubt not so much the strength of truth, but the well being of truth in a world of spin. I've read the, the ALA, the American Library Association's statement on freedom to read. I've read it and I've reread it. And it clearly advocates the, for the unrestricted flow of information. I continue to worry about the efforts to overwhelm truth with fallacious reasoning in book form. And so then I do consider some sort of rating system and realize that fact checking would be an enormous and endlessly controversial task. Sometime in the recent past, I recall hearing someone comparing the falsehood circulating in our news to a fire hose um, and trying to sort through a fire hose of information to find fact and fiction uh, would in fact be an endless job. So, and then it turns out, I looked up fire hose, I Googled fire hose of information or something. Turns out that it's an actual named technique of propaganda. In other words, overwhelm them with, with um, off information. So it's clear that a rating system is completely unlikely to be helpful. So then I think back to our opening words about how beliefs can be restrictive or expansive and regretfully have to admit that my desire to censor or ban those books um, would be as likely to lead to limitations as protection. Truly, only when I thought of meditation did I begin to find and remember some tools for responding to my panic. UU Buddhist David Reinick in his book, The This Truth Never Fails, writes, at the heart of things, there is a truth that is always revealing itself. What we long for is always present, hiding in plain sight. Every situation we encounter contains the truth of our existence, utterly reliable and always ungraspable. We are never separate from this mysterious aliveness, close quote. So what can we do? Well, we can remember to breathe, especially exhale. We can center. Some of us would pray. Some of us would go for a walk or work in the garden. But the goal is to come back somehow to ourself, our grounded, centered self. Then we can also make a real effort to discern fact from spin and exaggeration. I'm inclined to think that a study group focused on identifying various forms of sideways communication or propaganda could be helpful. I'm personally intending to tackle this. And if you're interested, you could let me know because companionship in this process would be useful. And in Greene County, we can ask the library to purchase um, factually accurate, accurate books from publishers like Beacon Press, which is the UUA's um, longstanding publishing house. Eva and I don't have solutions, but we, and we hope you, will recognize a moral panic when you see it or feel it. These are challenging times and there is no single action like banning a book that can resolve the matters that worry us. So in addition 
to whatever intellectual actions we can take, do also remember to breathe. <laughs> and we can start that right now. Exhale. Blessed be. Namaste. Amen. And thank you, Dacia, for making this service happen. And now the interlude is Nocturne, performed by John Prescott and Eva Rebold. <laughs> 